one of the big, um, most exciting developments, I think, because it applies, it's now being applied 30 million hectares in five continents with a, a um, wildlife ecologist in, in uh, then Rhodesia came, uh, named Alan Savory, and, and he was working with large animal herds. And also he was one of the um, founders because of his tracking skills in, in a famous anti-guerrilla regiment called the um, Salu Scouts during the Civil War there when they had to travel at night and barefoot. And that combination of experience, of experiences um, led him to ponder why the giant migratory herds in Africa, numbering the millions in those days, why the grasslands behind them were the healthiest that he'd encountered. And he thought about that and travelling at night with the, the scouts barefoot, he noticed that the grasslands where the large animal herds had grazed were soft and absorbent. Whereas where um, domestic livestock had been set stock, it was rock hard and um, not absorbent. So he eventually realised that the predator-driven mass herds, um, <coughs> and you had animals dunging and urining and, um, and chewing grass quickly and then moving on for probably six months rest, he, he realised that was ecologically positive to the um, ec ecosystems. And, um, so he then set about devising a human management system where humans became the predators, so by moving them regularly and, um, and f using fencing to uh, increase artificial mob density like the big herds. And anyway, cut a long story short, um, there's been some remarkable stories of landscape regeneration that's come from that. And um, I'll quickly tell the story of these other farmers who've now using natural grasslands to grow grain <coughs> because the background of that is uh, it's a journey in ecological literacy as well, this book. But the, the other two farmers that Tammy asked about are both um, New South Wales farmers out in the um, central west. It's a pretty tough, dry country. <coughs> in fact, you're not going to get innovation off the, uh, the best and richest soils like the Darling Downs. It's going to come from hard times. And um, so Colin Sice he lives near the, um, the old gold mining town of Golgong and uh, must have been um, the 80s. A, a bushfire came over the hill and totally burned him out. He lost everything, house, fences, all his stock. <coughs> Ended up in hospital for two weeks when he had plenty of time to think what he was going to do without any money. I don't think his insurance helped. And so he realised he had to get cropping <coughs> to get some turnover and um, in a basically in a pub session with a, a friend he decided well what we do have intact is our native grassland uh, in that case <coughs> the dominant grass was what um, ecologists call a, a c4 carbon-4 grass which is a perennial grass that um, goes dormant in the winter and is summer active and so he realized that if he could direct drill um, his cereals and canolas which by then were had evolved to be um, grazable um, by livestock, they're edible. If he drilled them in just as the native pasture was going dormant um, and then grazed it with this savoury method, he could ec ecologically stimulate the soils and stool the crop. And then when the grain was ripe, the grasses were waking, out, up, were waking up and you'd harvest the grain and then you had summer green feed. <coughs> and that's really how the system evolved and it took 10 years of tinkering. And um, he calls that um, pasture cropping and, and he's now evolving into stacking 20 species for different ecological function and it's, it's an ongoing, it's a movable feast. And then um, his friend about 80 kilometres away called Bruce Maynard, the same year pretty much, actually it was 96, I remember the year now, he stumbled on the same solution in even tougher country and he doesn't use any chemical or fertilisers so he now calls his system no-kill cropping and branding it as grassland grains and, and really what they've done is got the jump on some of the leading researchers in America who, um, such as Wes Jackson at the Land Institute, they're trying to breed um, sustainable crops from perennial grassland. So grasses that are much deeper rooted but have a different um, functional strategy to your annual basically uh, our cereals and crops like that are annual weeds. Their strategy is to have lots of seed, die and then the seed germinates, whereas your perennial <coughs> it's got 
complex co-evolved functioning with, with the microbial soil populations and other systems, but you don't get the yields. And um, Wes Jackson and others in America and the Russians and the Chinese and even Australians have been trying for decades to get sustainable <coughs> cropping yields off perennials and they haven't got there. But these two Australian mavericks have sort of jumped the gun by using uh, perennial grasslands and still the annual, annual system. So, um, <coughs> but I guess what I was alluding to earlier is, um, as a farmer who's made all the mistakes, I re realised on um, reflecting on it that what I didn't have was any literacy in how to read a landscape. So I didn't know what I was doing was doing harm to its complex systems. And, and, and getting back to Alan Savory again, he, he'd sort of in only two pages in one of his definitive books had outlined four key landscape functions, which really summarise a number of them, but it was basically the solar energy from which all our energy and civilization comes. Um, by plants with their solar panels, putting sugar into the, into the earth to feed the bugs and, and so on. And um, then there's a the water cycle, uh, healthy absorbent soils. And then the soil mineral cycle, you've got your bugs and other things recycling <coughs> and your, and your um, things like fungus accessing the nutrients for the plants in exchange for sugars. And then you've got a function of, if you like, biodiversity or dynamic ecosystems. And really, um, those were the four and they were left there. So I've sort of expanded that, but I've added a fifth, which is, as one farmer said, that square foot of real estate between our ears. Mm -hmm. And it's our belief systems, our paradigms, um, worldviews, and that's, those sorts of things, which probably the most important of all the functions, obviously. Um, and, but none of them you can separate out because you pull the rug on one and the others will go. So it's, they're all totally, interdivisible. And so the, the centre part of the book is really structured around um, describing these but through wonderful stories. So, so despite exposing early on the, what I call the mechanical mind and the industrial ag, the, the, the guts of the book is just stories of hope and on the ground practical solutions. And then the last part of the book really deals with some of the big picture stories like self-organisation and um, human health and, um, and how regenerative agriculture can address some of the Anthropocene challenges.